Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, uh, new team that we didn't uh, treat until now, which is uh, about wealth management at FinTech Age. So I welcome this morning Sofia Merloco, CEO of BNP Paribas, uh, uh, Yoni Asia, CEO and founder of eToro in Israel, uh, Tamás Gorgadze, uh, CEO of Raisin in Germany, and uh, uh, we was already there last year, thank you for your fidelity, loyalty. And uh, uh, Paolo Galvani, CEO and founder of Money Farm, uh, Italia, UK, I don't, it's Europe, okay? Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Sophia accepted that we do a small break to the French rule where we begin by women. And uh, by the way, I underline that uh, um, I was very criticized because we don't have so many women uh, in our panels. But uh, the fact is, the rule of this uh, event is only CEO on stage. So please tell to your institutions and tell to the fintech to have more CEO who are ladies. We don't have so much. And I must say that in fintech, it's even worse than in bank. Uh, in 600 applications, I have less than 10 applications led by a woman. So I can't do miracle with that. So um, it will be very simple. I will ask to all of you quite the same question, and we'll do this uh, the same order. Um, uh, first, who are you? Uh, you can mix if you want in the intro, but uh, who are you as a person, as a founder, but what is doing your company? Because I know you. You have a big documentation in the book you have in your bag about these companies, if you want to read it. Uh, but it's better if you explain with your world. When were you created? How much money did you raise? And what is your business? Where do you make money? A business is when you make money. So when are you doing that? And after, I have some other questions for you. Please, perhaps, Paolo, i let you begin. So good morning, everybody. Um, Paolo Galvani, um, I, I was a co-founder of Money Farm. Um, the company was started. Uh, formally in, in 2011, so um, it's now we are entering into our sixth year of, of this activity. What is Money Farm? Money Farm is a is a, a digital wealth manager. Um, there's this way of saying it, which is robot advisor uh, that nobody likes, but everybody understands. Um, so we keep on using it. Um, what what do we do? We basically help people uh, and small and medium sized investor to find. Um, an efficient, transparent, and, and I would say even low-cost solution to the investment proposition. So in other words, we're helping people to find what is a good investment based on their risk attitude, on their target, and the way in which they are thinking about to save their money. Um, of course, now we are, just like to make a brief uh, sum up of the company, we are now in two countries, we started in Italy. Now we are um, we have moved our head office in in London. We are roughly 80 people. We are working both in uh, in UK and in Italy. Um, we raised approximately uh, a bit less than uh, 30 million euro uh, through a couple of funds, and uh, uh, in the last year. We are also um, the presence of Allianz uh, uh, in, in our um, shareholders' composition. Um, I will start, I mean, I'll stop here and then, of course, questions will, will come. Please feel free to give details. Raisin. So, my name is Thomas. I'm a CEO and one of the founders of uh, Raisin. Um, my own background I was uh, as uh, Laurent in consulting industry for more than 10 years at McKinsey and then uh, realized that uh, I can create probably more value after 10 years somewhere else than at. Uh, a consulting company, so we created a first um, uh, digital marketplace uh, for um, people who want just to save uh, money in uh, in their deposit accounts. Uh, so how does that work? Is current client office uh, uh, opens an account with us and can select from different offers, different banks. We have currently um, in uh, uh, in total 27 banks which are online with us with more than 100 different offers. We launched in Germany. This is our home base. We have uh, 70 people working there um, and uh, expanded to Europe. We offer our service in almost all European countries. There is one minor exception. Uh, and have until now on the platform uh, brokered more than 2.2 billion euro in total. And uh, happy to announce today uh, a new funding round. So we've done uh, Series C funding. I tried to match exact date of the Paris FinTech Forum. Thank it was you. very hard, but... Uh, uh, we gave our best, so we raised additional 30 million uh, euro today, and in total, the company is funded with 60 million euro. Our main institutional shareholders are Thrive Capital, Index Ventures, and Rebit Capital. So 60 million, uh, more than 2 billion in, in, 
under uh, management. And how many customers you said? We have 60,000 customers uh, until now, and we're growing right now uh, by actually January will be our strongest month ever by roughly 15 to 20 percent in a single month. And yes. just to understand, what's the average amount of money people put in your? Uh, so active customer would be depositing with us around 58,000 euro currently. Thank you. Yoni, where are you? Hi, uh, I'm Yoni Asia. I'm the CEO and founder of eToro. Um, I'm from Israel. Uh, my wife is a fintech entrepreneur, so that's for your first comment. Uh, and she was invited. You yes. changed her. Oh, <laughs> I brought my father, so it's very good. Um, and uh, eToro today is the world's uh, largest social trading network, where we have over five million. Uh, registered users from all around the world who can trade the global markets, stocks from different exchanges, commodities, indices, ETFs in a social network where everybody can see, follow, and copy top traders from all around the world. Copy trading is basically money management 2.0. Instead of a face-to-face -face meeting with one money manager, you can actually see actual people's performance uh, from different countries, different strategies, uh, and then when you copy them, you actually copy their entire account into your, let's say, $5,000, $10,000, $50,000, uh, and mimic their performance. Um, we've uh, transacted last year more than $350 billion in volume, raised uh, $62 million from three of, uh, last round was three of the largest financial institutions in the world in Germany, China, and Russia, and we have about 350 people globally uh, serving customers from more than 100 countries. That's a... So you are quite big. Quickly. <laughs> um, first question for all of you, the question of the panel. What is for you wealth management and saving in 2017? Not only fintech age, but I mean digital and so on. What's for you the main difference uh, for customers, the, what they expect uh, in 2017? We can do the same way. I, I think that from, from the customer perspective, um, there's, uh, I mean, the, the lesson we've learned is that for people, there's a need to solve a problem rather than, um, rather than any other kind of feelings, right? So it, we're not entering to, we, we initially thought that um, there was some sort of passion in investing money uh, with, with, with people. Well, the vast majority don't feel this passion. The vast majority of people feels more pain and the frustration on having some money aside, they, they've managed to you know, obtain quite hardly. And, and then they, they have to make it work in the best way as possible. Um, and so frustration means that you know, in most of the cases, the solution are not transparent enough, it's not clear exactly what's going on. The communication between the solution provider and the client is very weak. All these aspects affect a lot the experience of the clients and at the end of the day is finding himself in a situation which is not exactly what he was looking for. So my, my, my idea of asset management, more wealth management, is really to make people more and more realize on what it's all about, what is the solution, what is the way in which they can invest their money, the, the connection between who's providing the solution, uh, the easiness, that's another critical point, and of course the cost. Uh, it was interesting the conversation before about the Ryanair uh, disrupting model and how the price dynamics could change um, the user behavior. Well, the problem in financial industry is that for most of the people, price is not a variable simply because they don't know how they are, what, how much they are paying. Right? I mean, most situation, it's v if you are asking, and we did few panel, and if you're asking people how much are you paying for in your investment, usually. There's no answer. Most of the people think they are not paying for investment. And few of them, they are associating the cost of investment with the cost of the online banking, which is completely different. So it's difficult to leverage this, this angle. Uh, it's much more important, I think, to make something easy, streamlined, very, very accessible and transparent. This is, I think, the most. So back to the product in terms of digital. I'd say uh, just to, to tap on that, I love uh, how you use the word passion. So our point of view is actually to, I agree that we have the passion as Itoro, as Itoro to the capital markets, to what's happening around the world. And I agree that not all people, our approach is to try and entice that passion because everybody has an opinion today about the markets. Everybody has their opinion about Trump. 
or Brexit or Bitcoin or what's happening in technology. And we're trying through basically uh, both our platform, push notifications over mobile, uh, advertising through YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, to basically get people to emotionally connect to their own investment thesis and sort of make their own decisions, even if it's copying professional managers or thematic investment products on eToro or a specific instrument, is really to help people connect with what they actually want to do in the markets because today it's easy to make your own decisions, but people don't necessarily know how to do it because they've never done it before. So it's like the very early stages of e-commerce, maybe 10 or 15 years today. Now it's in finance. People can actually make financial decisions, move money around the internet, a lot of great fintech companies, but most people still have that barrier. So our approach is basically, and we're actually lucky to have that uncertainty around the world and constant conversations about changes on you know, geopolitical environment to basically entice people to make the new decisions. That must be careful. Two Latin people. Uh, if you don't keep your microphone, you won't speak. <laughs> Okay, very good. Then uh, the good thing is I think that we are uh, very different to those both guys. So I will explain what we think is important for the client. So f uh, first thing, I think it's, uh, first thing is very much about access. So if you think about banking, it's the only industry in the world which uh, has resisted uh, in the last several hundred years to open platforms. So you can buy any product anywhere in the world. Uh, but if it's about banking products, simple as deposit, comparable everywhere, credit, you need to go to the bank, sometimes physically, you need to have online banking access of that particular bank, you need to uh, uh, do everything which the banks told you because of AML, KYC, other reasons. And this is the complexity we're taking out. So we see ourselves as a first marketplace, which really is an open platform for everywhere to join, and which gives a customer unique accessibility advantage. He goes to us and can do everything he wants to do about uh, this product world. The second thing is we think we can educate customers, we can make the product passionate. In reality, it's about functionality and return. Uh, so our customers get uh, a roughly last year seven times higher return on their savings than they would get outside on average in the market. And we show it to our customers, we calculate it on the platform, we make it very explicit how much we pay, very transparent, very simple to understand. And we're addressing the, where the money uh, is. Because in uh, Europe, uh, um, bank savings are the major savings uh, 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 destination, uh, and actually 10 trillion of client money lies around with zero interest rate, and this is the problem we're trying to solve. Frederick, uh, Frederick Udea was uh, saying just before you that, uh, okay, for payments, okay, for some commodities, but trusting a company with a Star Wars name, he didn't say so, but I said, uh, sorry, but Money Farm Raising. Uh, you changed them once already in one year. Last time you were not with that name. And eToro, I love that, but it could be a galaxy in Star Wars. So um, uh, giving trust to mass pe people, not only to the first 30,000, 60,000, even 100. Uh, do, uh, do you face this question of trust, or is it only a question of a panel? Do, do you see that when you grow, you have this question of how people will trust to let you money for a long term. It's not just for a payment to send to Singapore cheaper with TransferWise. It's to let you my money for my retirement. I'm working hard. I hope I will have that money. So uh, is it a reality for you in your day-to-day -day life to, to build this trust? All of you, you can react the way you want. I'm happy to start. So I think for us, um, it's uh, unbelievable how much uh, uh, people get give back once they are satisfied with the service. Uh, we track from day one everything. So NPS score last year has been 45. We uh, have 93% of our customers are willing to recommend. Uh, and we do some small services which make customers happy. So for example, if we have upcoming interest rate changes, we pre-inform the customers. They say, wow, that's great. The bank would never tell me that they're changing the rate. They would do it as covertly as possible. And then in the lower rate, you're telling me I can switch I can do until that moment my new deposit, so uh, uh, one, uh, one uh, very good feature. And uh, I think uh, uh, the trust you establish with, uh, you can only establish and radiate when you do a very good job with your existing customers. Uh, and I think uh, uh, we as f uh, fintechs can concentrate on customer experience because it's mostly one product area that we can really, really make uh, very well. And then, uh, Sorry, and I underlined that question because I fully understand. If you are there, it's because I believe in your product. So I fully understand that they are great and you, you build trust with your existing customer. So the problem is that 99.99% of the population who don't know you. 
uh, even if you have some good PR today. Uh, uh, how do you face that? Do you try to build some time partnership with big brands just to show you more? I don't know. It could be because a big brand invests in you and it's good publicity or whatever. How do you face that? So I, can, I can finalize. I think for us it's very specific because we actually offer bank products. So the underlying trust is we have 27 banks and they work with it's us and some of them are very large. So it's, uh, we uh, also uh, get some benefit from the uh, bank marketing because we represent also the banks. So, so I definitely say that uh, probably the biggest challenge of eToro uh, growing and growing faster is trust and distribution, which are very much correlated. <laughs> Uh, so we've seen over time, just over the past two years, for example, we've seen the average customer deposits on eToro grow 250% because people trust us more because we're growing as a company, but it's still probably, well, compared uh, to you guys, it's probably one divided by 100. So uh, it's still very hard for people to move a lot of money over the internet to, uh, to relatively new brands, so to move $1,000, when we started the average account on eToro was $300, it, and now it's uh, lifetime deposits of $3,000. Uh, I think their minimum is $250,000. <coughs> so as we go, the trust on, over the internet is becoming better. But we do believe, and I think this is a great trend that we've seen over the past couple of years, really just the two, th three last years, is that big banks uh, are actually now partnering with fintechs. Uh, in general, and specifically, for example, Editoro, uh, our last round was led by large financial institutions. And in Russia, for example, we're running Etoro in Russia with Sberbank, the largest bank there. And we definitely saw a huge added value of customers saying, okay, my funds are in Sberbank, I'm moving in and out money from Sberbank, I trust that uh, brand. Uh, uh, with my money, and I'm using the eToro technology for my in innovation and user experience. Paolo, some question we just an add on. If I may say, when we had big issue with bank, I don't speak of 2008, but when we have a big issue with bank, we don't see the day after all people going to banks and take their money because they are afraid of the banking system. But even if you are three of you doing a very good job, we have thousands of fintech. Aren't you sometimes afraid that the trust could be affected by perhaps some less good fintech than you? Uh, having an issue with security, with whatever, and tomorrow people think, mm, perhaps money farm or whatever, we should be careful. So it's not only the trust you build for your product, but also this new ecosystem. For the system, <clears throat> well, that, you know, the, the security is, 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 is a threat for, 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 for the industry as a whole, right? I mean, it's, it's not just pure fintech problem, it's a problem of, and we know that even large bank, I mean, in, in, in different ways have been affected by different type of security problems across. cross. So, so of course, the smaller you are, the potentially more you could affect it. So far, the, the advantage of, of FinTech world is that they rely on, on new te technology and, and really new paradigm in terms of the way in which the, the platform has been built. So I think this is more a positive than a negative because you know the, the strength of what you are building is really uh, proved day by day in, in the way in which we are building stuff, you know, as, as you move for, uh, forward. Uh, just one thing about the trust. I, I agree with, um, uh, with what has been said. There's less problem of what everybody is thinking about the trust concept in terms of position yourself. It's not that people, because you're not a big brand name that don't give you money. There's, and actually what's happening is what uh, Yoni was saying, people start trying your service and as soon as they realize how good it is, they keep on putting more and more money. And this is our story and our experience. Um, and as well, the other very encouraging signal is that you know, as people stay and understand what you are doing, they're done leaving. They, they, they don't let uh, the service go. So they, they, the churn is amazingly low. The big challenge is just how to position yourself. And as you said, right, I mean, the, the, the amount of marketing dollar you can spend and the amount of pressure from the competitors is so big that, you know, to position yourself to build the brand from scratch is, is a, is a, is a long-term uh, goal. You cannot manage to make this happen in, in a couple of years. It, it takes step by step. Of course, once you have... Um, just like in our case, an investment from um, um, the largest insurance uh, group in Europe. Well, that is kind of a rubber stamp on top of it, right? And, and reinforce the quality of what we have done. And, and of course, helps to 
position better. But you managed to keep your independence. Yeah. Well, yes, because uh, what, what we are trying to do is to disrupt. I don't like the word, but in a, to, to propose a different way to, to, to offer uh, the wealth management services. And I think everybody in the industry is interested to understand whether the new model, the, which is going to be the new paradigm, right? So the investment, uh, I think, from, you know, from, from the large players are all going into this direction to understand how these things could grow, which is the position, which is the potential. So there's, there's no interest in entering into something and then modify the DNA and the code on what you are doing, because otherwise we are keep on going back to, uh, to square one. On the other side, sorry, this allows as well to build potential projects that are thought together, right? So from you know, a large institution and a, and a fintech company, and to see how these things could be delivered in the market. We you already answered a bit to my next question, so I continue with you just to finish. So for you, banks and financial institutions, competitors or friends? Um, well, <clears throat> no, I don't, I don't see, I don't see, I don't see this big competition at this point. I think much more, I think that there's big, my point of view is that the market is so big and, and, and I have no doubt that the, that the, that the trend is definitely the one that will position digital solution as a sort of a bigger pillar that I think that more and more there will be situation like ours, a company like ours, that will team up and understand better alongside their core line, a uh, way to interact with a traditional player. I think the industry will, will be changed. There will be different way in which it's going to change. Uh, I'm expecting more and more cooperation than, than fight. Um, and that's my sense. It's like men and women. It's a su we're, we're in the suitor's stage. We're both trying to work with each other, but it's not exactly there yet. But for you, so it's still, it's more friends or foes? No, it's de so it's definitely the beginning of a, of a potentially wonderful partnership, uh, but we need to learn how to work with each other. So for, for example, for us in China with Ping An, we're working separately with four different subsidiaries of Ping An, uh, where the venture arm of Ping An just told us, go sign an agreements with each of them, and we need to do a lot of work to, to, to work and to distribute our products through them. So I think the big banks and financial institutions still don't have clear execution abilities how to work with fintechs, nor do fintechs have clear abilities of how to work with big banks, but I think there is a lot of interest on both sides to work together. That reminds me that this afternoon at 2.20 we have a panel bank plus fintech love story. So. Uh, moderated by Nino Renault from Les Echo. I don't ask you that question because you work mainly with banks, so I know they are your friends. Uh, <laughs> actually, so one anecdote, uh, because uh, we're working on the, on, the, on the product provider side, so we're launching right now an API where banks can have our liquidity solution in their online banking. Uh, and uh, what I found out, I, I was pretty amazed because we had like first, second meeting, we're talking with, I think, majority of the largest banks in Europe, and uh, there is a lot of interest, and then I, when I asked why do you want to talk with us, they said it's easier than work with a bank because they could introduce themselves a solution, but they see us as a small fintech, agile enough, fast enough to introduce a solution which works, then putting individual solutions themselves and plugging in the bank. So I think in that constellation, it's even a better solution to have a fintech in between as a service provider than to work uh, directly bank operation. Banks are also very much suspicious of each other. So what does that bank want with my clients? So they do not have that fear if we work with them together, which is positive. Uh, as you were speaking of men and women, I have to speak not to a woman. So, uh, Sophia, first reaction to all what we heard for the last 20, 30 minutes. Okay, so, well, is it okay? So first, probably let me introduce myself also, also because uh, wealth management within BNP Paribas is, of course, a business line which uh, deals with uh, individuals. So we are now uh, roughly uh, having 340 billion euros of assets from our clients, so uh, in Europe, Asia, and the United States. And uh, in fact, we have a holistic approach, which means that we could work with all of you guys, but uh, because we work for our clients, for daily banking, credits, investments, financial investment, and not just real estate, art, whatever. So really, uh, it's a global approach. And what I think is that clearly we are here also to cooperate and to work closely with fintechs. And I would say that as a bank, we have to support fintechs. We can connect fintechs because we are 
clearly in an ecosystem where everything is going on. And we work closely with fintechs because fintechs could help us to change also our way of thinking and of working. So uh, in terms of examples, supporting fintechs, we of course uh, could take some, uh, some stakes in funds. We have just recently took uh, stakes in Serena Capital because we want to really dig in the data management aspects. We are in Partech. We also have taken a, a share in PayCar. In pay the other thing also which is really important as BNP Paribas is concerned, we are in an ecosystem, as I said, with corporate clients, wealthy clients, individuals, and we have launched different initiatives to make connection between startups, fintechs, and our clients. Typically, we have corporate clients who just want to know with what kind of fintech they could work, or what kind of startups. So what we made, we have an Innov and Connect session, which every year we try to figure how we can link the project of our corporate clients with fintechs. And we have now clearly 20 projects which are going on, which is a way to integrate fintechs in the ecosystem where we are in. The other aspect is we are wealthy clients because they want to diversify. Sometimes they just want to also invest in fintechs. But they say, okay, how can you bring me some fintechs that I will understand what they're doing or startups? So we have also some events that we call Meet the Startups. We made that in Italy. We are making that in Belgium, in France, just for our clients to understand and to dig and to discuss with us. So these are clearly things that we are really rolling out in different countries because we think that this is global. And the other aspect is how we can work more with fintechs because we could, in fact, work with all of you clearly, if we want. What we define at the wealth management business line, uh, we were probably the, the only one five years ago to say that we need to be more digital. So we named uh, CDO at the time, uh, as many other uh, retail uh, customers were doing. And then two years ago, we thought that our clients, the behaviors of our clients would change because of this digitalization. And we thought that this is going faster than what we thought five years ago. This is probably the main issue. The things are going faster. So what we did is that at this time, two years ago, we worked in four countries, France, Belgium, Italy, Hong Kong, with clients, fintechs during three days, three days all in all, to define what should be, what will be the new client experience, what the expectation of our clients will be for digitalization. So we created our customer journey, which is onboarding, trust, and uh, reviewing peers to peers. This is what the clients say, said us. And then we work with fintechs, and we saw that some of the fintechs could help us in these different touch points. So then we defined 75 initiatives, 15 priorities last year. And how we did that? We, because the fintechs gave us this new way of working, we um, organize like side factories in Luxembourg, Singapore, and uh, Switzerland, where we have clients, people of the bank, fintechs working with us, creating minimum viable products that we are really testing, which help us to change the way we are working. Because every time, and I heard the previous conference, you said you have legacies. How are you going through this IT legacy to go faster? So of course we have those legacies, but we could go faster, but we have for that to work quicker. And the fintechs help us to think differently. So we work in kind of pizza team, and we save every time we need to launch these minimal viable products in three to six months, not 22 years. So clearly, you tell me last time, but are you going to again give me uh, I want 90 to ask you that question pages. more. On, I, I want to come back more on that. So we understood the answer on cooperation, competition with fintech. Thank you. To come back more on the wealth management uh, uh, focus. Um, I told you that I was a customer of yours and not so happy on the onboarding. And I was wanted to try their services because I had to sign a 92 pages 
document uh, uh, for credit, uh, you know, wealth management distribution. And you tell me, don't leave, we have a solution. So are you really working on that kind of thing to be as efficient as my friend? Because they, they won't never let me sign 92 pages. They don't even know how to print that. So. <laughs> yeah. no, you, you're right. The thing is that in banks, as we said, we have uh, a lot of regulation, and the regulation is not finished. Huh? European one, French one, or even in each country. So every regulator is not probably all thinking about digitalization. So we need still to have some papers to be signed. This is. Uh, the, the issue, as far as we are going a lot of products also, if you have just one product, it's probably easier than if we have a lot. So what we have decided, because we have to face this, clients are not happy with that, and digitalization could make something. So we work with the startups uh, on in, in artificial intelligence, and we will be launching pretty soon what we call a one-page contract, which means that this 92 pages or the 50 pages, depending on what you are uh, dealing with the bank, will be just summarized in just one page. And then the clients will see this one page will be the synthesis of all the other pages because unfortunately Sophia, we I take your word. Next year on the same stage, I will say if it was true after a few okay, months. Okay. Because I am a customer, just, I can check. Okay, <laughs> but, but if you are already onboarded... Uh, oh, yeah, we don't know other things. Okay, I okay. can buy so the product just to try. Okay. Next year you can actually ask her, hopefully we'll have the same stage, and ask her whether we managed to work with her, one of us, and she said three to six months. That means by next year we're already working together. If, if you are competitive with what was you were asking, <laughs> uh, probably we could work with you. Oh, by the way, you, um, that makes me say something, that um, Sophia told me directly this morning that she came not only just to be a panel on RUM, she wants to meet whoever FinTech wants to work with wealth management industry. So. Uh, and I could say that uh, for the FinTech, we have uh, an app which is called OpenUp, and I think it's interesting for you to have it in mind. Open up is open to all our business line within the bank, not just wealth management. All the business line are now digitalizing their subs. They put the projects and the fintechs could come and pitch for the projects directly on the app. And of course, uh, all of us internally could see if the fintech has already worked with someone else in the bank and then we could go forward. So open up, just go for it. Just come back to wealth management in general. In preparation, you told me whatever is a very big and nice interest of the different products we can have around the table. Um, wealth management of wealthy people is not only three verticals, it's many, many, many services, in your point of view at least. Uh, can you perhaps develop a bit uh, on that point? Yes, I think that, uh, as I said, well, we have this holistic approach, and when the client comes to us, so we begin at 250 and uh, we go for more, um, what we say for them and what they're asking is two things, trust, and diversification. So trust, we have our brand, and we could, of course, trust them. They could trust us because uh, they have one person in front of them, and we are all the expertise that we can bring to them. And then, of course, diversification for us is very important for the wealthy people because they couldn't put all their eggs in the same net. So, of course, there will be deposits, but there will be investments in terms of financial. And even in financial investments, in open architecture, we will be there to validate all the kind of um, ETF or investment funds or securities or bonds or whatever they want or strategic products. So in fact, we work with all kind of asset managers or other banks also. We are not just in-house producer. So we are there in front of our clients to be sure that we work for them on a long-term view, which means that is probably the difference. We are not pushing products. And when we work with clients, we have the family, we have the company, and we're trying to put the bridges between the company and the family because they want also to have this vision, long-term vision, about how they have to structure their wealth, how they have to transmit their wealth. So in fact, we are a kind in a term of intimacy to follow the client and his family all the way along. So this is why we could work with FinTech, but we have this long-term uh, partnership with our clients, and it's important for the trust. Just last question because we're out of time, but we discussed about the fees bit, uh, in the uh, first panel before you, and I was in another panel a few months ago with another wealth management institution saying that there is an issue with all these new fintechs that in their verticals they manage to offer very low pricing. And I may say, sorry, it's not only for you because I tested other of your competitors, you are quite expensive. And the problem is sometimes you don't price what I expect. For example, 
it's very difficult to sell me, because I don't accept that, the advisor service, which is the costly side. So you sell me 300 euros just to print a paper for my uh, um, paperwork for um, uh, IRS, I mean, sorry, revenue services, or you, you ask me uh, 30 euro a month just for a report which is free on an app in you know, all of their services. So perhaps you don't build a good service because you don't dare to say to the customer, sorry, advisory is expensive because it's a guy speaking with you one hour. So don't you think you will have to change the way you, you price the services in order to be competitive with all these almost free services? The question is very interesting, and as far as we are located in Europe, in Asia, and in the States, uh, the, this question of price is totally different by the culture in each country. Sure. Uh, I would say that you are a French, French. <laughs> so French are not used to pay for service. That's, that's clear. <laughs> and probably banks have worked on that for many, many years, and it's difficult now, to, but it will be necessary because the regulation tomorrow, next year, will come up and will ask to more transparency so that the people will have to pay for the service. If I go to the United States, people are really paying for the service because it's, it's in the culture, uh, in Belgium too. So of course we have this kind of issue in France, but then I think that this, was, this will evolve and uh, because the, the, the financial sector will evolve also for that. And of course FinTechs will be probably there to make the service being paid in a certain way uh, and we will have also to make sure that uh, we are giving the service that the client is expecting at the right price. This is probably our main issue, but uh, I'm quite confident because we are already in the wealth management, even in France, because you, are, you know exactly what you are paying. So we are transparent when we ask the client to come to us, we tell him what will be the cost. So then the client will say, okay, it's too costly or not, but we are transparent in the way that it, no, it won't be for free. And so the question is to compare when we are explaining for instance, the wealth planning, when the client is having one hour or two hours with an engineer from us, he's not paying because all, it's an all-in fee. If he goes to a lawyer, he will pay 1,000 euro for the hour. So then depends on what he will think about the price. Thank you very much. We have to close it because we have another keynote right now. We will short it in 10 minutes instead of 20, but we have to close now. But I would just if you... One minute. Yeah, just for women, if, if I may. Please. Because as you said, uh, there are not so many women in entrepreneur and not in fintech. And I think that I'm personally really involved in trying to make more women uh, involved in entrepreneurship, role model. So we work on different programs. And uh, we think that banks are there also to support in the ecosystem the women entrepreneurs, the women in the fintech. And so we have launched uh, three years ago a partnership with Stanford to help them to be trained, be networking, and making business. So please, for the women, just uh, be sure that you are standing up like the other men. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, all of you. Sorry to be in a rush. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You can applaud them.